Okay, hello everyone. So today we're following on from my gas exchange lecture going into respiratory disorders. So mainly we're going to talk about asthma and COPD. Firstly, shirt check. We've got the Brighton & Hove Touch Rugby shirt uh, representing number 14 at the back. It's kind of my number. And uh, yeah, and let's get straight into it. So if we talk about uh, the basic symptoms that occur during um, an asthma attack or uh, a case of COPD. So we've got this type 1 um, hypoxia, which is the inability to oxygenate, to inspire air and reduce the oxygen content. And we also have this cyanosis, which is basically blowing up the fingers. So yeah, and the causes can include lung disease, ventilation error, poison, and kind of on a systematic point of view, the normal pressure of oxygen is around 100 milligrams uh, millimeters per mercury, and that can fall to about 60. Or you can measure the saturation um, of hemoglobin, and that will be below 90%. This can be due to inspired air that has reduced oxygen content, so such as high altitude, insufficient gas exchange between the oxygen and carbon dioxide, or some part of the lung is obstructed or damaged. On the other front, we can have an over exposure to carbon dioxide, so a pressure of over 50. And that can include airway obstruction again, pneumonia uh, or asthma. Uh, we get this reflex which increases breathing, because as we talk about in the gas exchange lecture, when we breathe out, we get this carbon dioxide out as well as water. So if the pressure of carbon in the body increases, we increase the acidity. So one of the ways uh, our body deals with that is by expiring more carbon dioxide to get this equilibrium of carbonic acid in the blood and drive down the pH. And then that, this could lead to respiratory acidosis. So if we talk about this hypo, hyp, hypocapnia versus hyper, so too little or too much carbon dioxide. So we've got this reaction again driven by carbonic anhydrase. So as uh, carbon dioxide is blown out, the pH uh, rises, so we've got alkalosis, so the pH increases, or a decrease uh, of pH and an increase in pCO2, and that leads to acidosis. Respiratory disorders, they can either be obstructive, so we've got increased resistance of the airflow, such as in asthma and COPD, and that can also lead to damage to cilia. We have this restrictive, reduced compliance, so damage to the alveolar membrane, such as in fibrosis, cancer, or infection. So if we get straight into it, so we've got asthma, uh, which is the chronic inflammatory disease of the airways, and it affects roughly 8 to 10% of the UK pop. And this is seen by hyperreactivity of smooth muscles, hypersecretion of mucus and inflammation, also wheezing, especially night wheezing, and difficulty breathing. So we've got this interest, intrinsic and extrinsic factors which can trigger it. Trigger, so intrinsic can be a range, a range of factors such as viral, cold air shock. Uh, as it was seen, this respiratory syncytial virus, RSV, can cause infections in adults and children. And it was seen that people who got this virus were more likely to develop asthma further on in life. So then we've got extrinsic, so that's your aller allergy. So such as cat saliva, animal tender, cow's milk and nuts. So we've got, if you kind of talk about the overview of asthma and the early phases of what happens. So when um, an allergen is inhaled, the allergen binds to this IgE, which is uh, secreted by T lymphocytes. So that's your um, immunoglobin E. And that binds to mast cells in the lungs, which result in the release of histamines and leukotrienes. And this can cause the smooth muscle cells of the bronchi to contract, so as we talked about before, uh, which now is the bronchi of the lumen, and therefore we have difficulty breathing. Further on, in the late phase, so when we've had this allergen in the body for a bit now, the histamine and leukotrienes attract an accumulation of eosinophils and increase the production of mucus by goblet cells. So eosinophils, they're kind of the, the the guys that come in when we've got an allergy and cause this inflammation and stuff like that. And with repeated attacks, the lining of the bronchi can become damaged. And although asthma can begin as an allergic reaction, if attacks can be triggered by non-specific factors like cold air exercise and tobacco smoke. So if we talk about the phases of an asthma attack and what, and what happens uh, in more detail, Firstly, we've got this alkalosis, as we've got this low PCO2 uh, or high oxygen, and we get this short of breath uh, and anxiety, and we start to hyperventilate. So, because we start to hyperventilate, we breathe out more carbon dioxide. 
and the pressure drops from 40 to about 30 and therefore the blood pH will rise so we've got this alkalosis. So we've got moderate so things kind of start to go back to normal so we've got this normal pH normal uh, pco2 as our breathing starts to slow down and decrease in po as we because we're still hyperventilating it becomes harder to breathe and that's why we slow down and um, the release of carbon dioxide so we come back come back, back to normal uh, however the po2 would decrease as we're not able to take on in, in enough oxygen when we kind of stop breathing slowly and we breathe less we get into this acidosis because we're not able to expel this carbon dioxide or take in oxygen. So the PCO2 rises to about 50 and pH falls below 7.4. And this is when we get into this hypoxemia and hypercapnia and we get respiratory acidosis because there's so much carbon dioxide, it drives the pH down. So the medication, so we've got relievers in an event of an asthma attack, these B2 agonists, anticholinergic drugs, and PED4 inhibitors, and the, the preventers of an asthma attack are corticosteroids, which we'll talk about in the following lectures. So then moving swiftly on into COPD, so we just have the uh, have to define these um, kind of these terms, just get on board with it. So we've got bronchitis, so inflammation of the bronchi, chronic just means persistent uh, bronchitis, emphysema, damage to the alveoli, pulmonary just referring to the lungs, and the COPD is defined as persistently poor airflow as a result of breakdown of lung tissue and dysfunction of the alveoli. So the signs, so we've got these neutrophils found in airways. Get this bronchitis that's seen by blue bloaters in the, in the bronchi. And we start to hyperventilate. We've got this low FEV1, which we'll talk about later, and a cough sputum. Then we've got this emphysema, which are seen by pink puffers. Um, barrel, barrel chest, dry cough, uh, low exercise tolerance, but we're, ma we're still able to maintain that PO2 at rest. So the diagnosis, uh, similar similar to what you can use with asthma, I've got the spirometry, FEV will decrease, improving in this imp and improving in FEV1 of less than 10 after inhalation of salbutamol. So what happens is uh, the patient's given the salbutamol and seeing how much their FEV1 will increase and depending on how much it increases or not, we can uh, diagnose if it's COPD or asthma. Also, we can check the arterial blood gases, so the CO2 and O2 in the blood. So this FEV1, less than one litre, means hypoxemia and hypercapnia curves. So we've got this little table here comparing the COPD and asthma. So you can have a look here. It's the best to kind of look at the things that are the opposites. So we've got chronic productive cough, quite uncommon in asthma, but common in COPD. A nighttime wheeze, especially in asthma, and a variability of symptoms in asthma or CPD is seen to be quite consistent. So how can we diagnose these diseases? So we've got x-rays. So we can find abnormally x-rays findings not usually done until COPD is severe, and it, it c can tell us stuff, but it doesn't give us much detail. We can have the flattening of the diaphragm and increased jet size, also abnormal air collections, you can see that in the x-ray. Then we've got spirometry, so basically the measurement of breath, and we can measure the volume and speed of air that can be inhaled and exhaled. So a person with emphysema will have lower, a person with emphysema will have lower expiratory reserve and smaller inspiratory reserve, so overall a smaller capacity to be able to breathe in and breathe out. Then we've got this peak expiratory flow, so the maximum speed of expiration, and that's in liters per minute. Forced vital capacity, so the volume of air that you can forcibly blow out at one time after inspiring. And FEV1 um, says basically the volume you can expel in one second. And then you can do this FEV1 over FVC to get a ratio. And if it's less than uh, 0 0.7, you can we can say that there's some sort of airway obstruction. Then we can look at these flow volume tubes. So on the y-axis, we've got an inspiration expiration. On the x-axis, we've got the volume. So as you can see that when we kind of expire, we, we at the start, it's quite sharp because we're trying to get it all out and then it kind of slows down. But it, when we're inspiring, it's kind of consistent. We breathe in to our um, kind of peak at the bottom here and then we breathe in the rest. And um, this is a good way of distinguishing between asthma and COPD. As, so asthma is reversible with this short acting beta egg agonists uh, challenge, unlike COPD. So if we give give this SABA to patients, uh, you see an improvement in asthma, whereas in COPD you wouldn't. 
And then we can wish I will measure this tidal breath. So a flow volume curve during a normal inspiration expiration. In COPD, as you can see, this is a normal person here. But on this one, you can see how COPD can uh, mess us up. So airflow is severely diminished and expiration is prolonged. And uh, this MEV um, curve here. You can see it's um, much smaller than an MIF, uh, and normal expiration is the same as full. So as you can see, obviously that shouldn't be the case. Whereas uh, this is asthma here, so yellow yellow is the the patient there, and uh, the greens after being given salbutamol. So you can see an improvement, and the white's the predicted, so it should be in a normal person. So you can see how salbutamol uh, helps the person out to breathe more but you wouldn't see this in a COPD patient. We can also look at uh, muscles. So this is specifically good in children who may not uh, co cooperate as well in these spirometry tests. Uh, so children could have difficulty speaking and getting like a full sentence out in one breath and kind of control their breathing. And you can also watch the kid breathe to see how their muscles contract. So we've got these different muscles here because um, children can be difficult to work with if you give them the clinical scores. Um, so points are worded for we using retractions and dyspnea. So the more points you get, the worse off you are. And we can give this uh, classic asthma uh, bottle that you see, which is an nebulizer, and has the drug delivered in the form of a mist, and that's inhaled and should relieve symptoms. We can also see this nighttime wheeze, and that can be due to cortisol levels. This can be due to cortisol levels being low, which could allow for lower protection against these allergens that we can inhale during the night. We also have this parasympathetic response where we have increased acetylcholine released at night and that can cause more bronchial contraction. And also, uh, you can also have a GP concern. A GP could notice some other conditions apart from asthma, which could lead to development of, so always um, get checked out if you need anything. So that's basically it on COPD and asthma. Um, hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to like and subscribe, leave a comment. And yeah, check out the description for my affiliate links and the questions and my social media. So make sure to follow me. And yeah, thank you for watching. Have a good day.